Hello all, uh, welcome to this lecture. We talk about cow lengthening. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Antesti online group, and especially Dr. Mazin Domani, my good friend and exceptional friend, uh, for inviting me to uh, present on this online uh, conference. I hope to give you, uh, that this lecture will be beneficial and interesting to you all. Thank you. Now, let's start. Uh, cow lengthening uh, procedures are important procedures and um, they are the most common periodontal surgeries and they are applied in multiple uh, conditions and uh, they have multiple uses as we will discuss this presentation. Now, cow lengthening, it's a surgical procedure undertaken to expose a uh, greater amount of the tooth structure, either around a single tooth or a group of teeth. Uh, cow lengthening is one of the most needed and encountered periodontal surgeries. We'll see its applications in, and methods. Could be divided into two groups, cow lengthening in patients with gingival excess, gingival enlargement, for example, to improve smile aesthetics, or to provide access for cleaning, in patients with gingival tissue excess, gingival enlargement. Uh, usually involves reshaping and recontouring of gingival tissue, and in some cases, it might, we might need some osseous recontouring. So mostly it's soft tissue surgery, but in some cases we might need to do some hard tissue surgery, bone recontouring or shaping. Examples, ultra-passive eruption, we'll talk about this condition later. Hereditary gingival fibromatosis, which is a hereditary condition associated with gingival enlargement. Sometimes it could be debilitating with gingival overgrowth covering the whole of the tooth, the uh, tooth crowns. And um, uh, need to be cut. We need to do a uh, gingivectomy. We need to treat it. And there is an added complication here is the risk of recurrence. Even after we're doing treatment, crow lengthening, gingivectomy, it could recur again uh, on these patients. And uh, then there are drug-induced gingival enlargement. Uh, there are certain drugs that uh, could cause gingival enlargement. The most famous of them uh, is dilantin or phenytoin for the treatment of epilepsy, uh, nifidibine for the treatment of uh, blood pressure, and some other drugs uh, like uh, cyclosporine and uh, these drugs uh, should be evaluated and we might part of the treatment uh, if, if we do any procedure in these patients part of the treatment will include modification of their medications by changing these medicines this causing uh, gingival enlargement into other uh, alternatives that are not causing gingival enlargement. And then reactionary gingival enlargement, um, kinds of allergy reactions. And then the second group of cow lengthening procedures are done to facilitate restorative treatment. So the first one for the treatment of gingival growth or overgrowth or gingival enlargement mostly soft tissue surgery with little cases needing uh, bone surgery. The second group to facilitate restorative treatment by exposure of subgingival caries or fracture line usually involves removing a reshaping of bone and uh, gingiva. So this is mostly requiring uh, hard tissue and soft tissue surgery. <coughs> Examples, access for subgingival caries and other defects to create a ferrule for a post-crown to increase clinical crown height prior to the restoration, like, for example, short clinical crowns uh, that we need to correct before doing a restoration like crowns or fillings. Often the patient chief complaint is short teeth or gummy smile. Treatment planning requires understanding of the gingival complex, comprehensive facial evaluation before doing crown lengthening. So planning is very important in these cases. We need to evaluate several factors before doing our procedure. It will help us to choose the procedure that we will use 
and will help us also to uh, choose uh, the, during the case selection. Etiology of clinical accounts could be divided into two categories, causes of uh, short clinical crowns, uh, either could be coronal destruction, either from traumatic injury, fracture, um, could be from caries, or uh, subgingival caries, could be from incisal attrition, non carious to surface loss lesions like attrition, abrasion, erosion, uh, causing coronal destruction, uh, we might, and short clinical crowns. And then coronally situated gingival complex, uh, resulting from tissue hypertrophy, gingival overgrowth, uh, or a phenomenon known as ultra passive eruption, which we will talk about shortly. And we will discuss now the factors that we should evaluate uh, during the planning stage. The first thing we need to do a thorough, full medical history. We should check for any clinical conditions the patient might have. Um, they might uh, for example, impact the healing, like for example in diabetes, or they might affect uh, the inflammation, the response, uh, could affect the immunity, might be associated with periodontal disease. So we need to uh, have a full medical history. And we should also have medication history. We should record all the medicines taken by the patient. As we said earlier, some medicines could be associated with gingival enlargement, and these medicines need to be uh, reviewed, and we need to change them in case of gingival enlargement into alternatives that are not associated with gingival enlargement, of course, in consultation with a physician or treating that patient. Smoking. Smoking. Uh, by itself, it's not an absolute contraindication to surgical treatment. We could do surgery for smokers, but it will affect the healing. We reduce the therapeutic effect of periodontal surgery. Uh, so smokers need to be encouraged to abstain from smoking. Uh, they should be advised to visit uh, smoking cessation clinics, should be warned about the substantial reduction of healing. Of course, we can't... Uh, it, it, in the end, it's up to the patient themselves, and um, we can't force them to stop smoking. We should at least advise them to um, that uh, there will be a reduction in the clinical outcome uh, with associated with smoking. Uh, the second factor that we need to evaluate, gingival biotype. This is the thickness of a gingiva. How thick is the gingiva? It has significant impact on the outcome of restoration, restorative therapy, regenerative therapy, implant therapy. It need to be. Uh, it was suggested that there is a direct correlation between susceptibility to gingiva recession followed by any surgical procedure. A little bit of gingiva recession could happen with any perinatal surgery that involves exposure of the periosteum and or periosteal stripping, and. Um, it increases in patients with thin gingival biotype. So it's important to evaluate this at the start. This could be done visually by looking at it, uh, or we need to do some invasive measurements. We could do in probing, for example. Um, we could see the shadow of the probe in thin gingival biotype. Well, if it is, the gingiva is thick, we will not see the shadow of that probe. Uh, the second method is transgingival probing, and here we puncture the gingiva, measure its width by or thickness by the periodontal probe, of course under local anesthesia, because so that we don't cause pain for the patient. And um, here are examples of thin biotype and thick biotype. Thin biotype, as we see here, thick biotype, we can see more thick gingiva, and more keratinized gingiva, which is, you see, it is whitish here compared to the uh, yellowish, sorry, to the reddish alveolar mucosa. And in some cases, it could be pigmented with melanin, uh, which is a variation in normal anatomy for some patients. Uh, of course, there is a non-invasive method 
for measuring the dimensions of the gingival complex is by doing CBCT. Uh, we could identify the landmarks like the alveolar crest and measure the attachment level and we could even measure the thickness of the alveolar bone and the thickness of the soft tissue in CBCT. So if we, and CBCT is needed sometimes for the planning of surgeries or for planning implant surgery, uh, so it will be a plus. Uh, we could get some more information from CBCT when we need to do it for the patient. Um, the next factor to evaluate or check is keratinized gingiva. Uh, we've shown you earlier the keratinized gingiva, the whitish or brownish uh, gingiva that is usually thick and different from the reddish thin alveolar mucosa. Uh, keratinized gingiva uh, adequate since 1972, the landmark study of Lang and Lu suggested a minimum of 2 mm of keratinized tissue is needed. 1 mm of it is attached, was necessary for the prevention of future recession. So Lang and Lu advised to have keratinized tissue and even it was advised to do uh, gingival grafting to increase the thickness of gingiva and increase the keratinized gingiva band that we have. Uh, recently, uh, what we are thinking, the consensus uh, that we have, is that a minimum amount of keratinized gingiva is not needed in case to prevent attachment loss if good condition, good oral hygiene is there. So if good oral hygiene is there, we less need uh, presence of thick keratinized gingiva. Uh, and uh, in case the oral hygiene is less, let's say poorer oral hygiene, poorer plaque control, suboptimal plaque control, it's more important to maintain uh, more to have keratinized gingiva, good amount of keratinized gingiva before doing surgery. So if oral hygiene is good, the importance of keratinized gingiva is less needed. If oral hygiene is poorer, uh, the importance of having keratinized gingiva increases. And here, how we measure keratinized gingiva by the periodontal probe. The next factor is the periodontal attachment, the, which is uh, obtained from the uh, periodontal ligament around the, the roots of the teeth. So the crown root ratio, very important. Having uh, increased crown root ratio uh, means that more recession has happened, more loss of uh, alveolar bone, or maybe short roots for the tooth. So it's important to have high quality Brabica radiographs to allow assessment of the, uh, the following factors. Bone support, endodontic status, whether there is root care treatment or not, uh, whether there are periabical lesions or lateral lesions or uh, forcation lesions, the root configuration, whether the roots are long or short, tapered or thick, uh, the root length and proximity to adjacent teeth. Uh, like, for example, in this case, we have enough width or a good width of alveolar bone, interdental bone between the teeth while distal to the six. Uh, we have less thick, uh, less amount of interdental bone, and in this case, uh, when we have less uh, amount of interdental bone, this is more susceptible to recession with inflammation. While if we have more width of interdental bone, uh, this is less susceptible to recession and loss with time after surgery. Uh, position of the forcation on multi-rooted teeth. Uh, radiographic analysis suggested they part in 2003 suggested uh, that a minimum distance of 4 mm is required from the forcation to the alveolar bone crest preoperatively to reduce the risk of forcation exposure, uh, which might not be always feasible. Sometimes we can't have this amount of bone, it's not present or like this. Um, so, we need in these cases, we need to weigh the risks. For example, if we need to do crown lengthening and there is expected exposure of the forcation, 
we need to weigh the risks. Why? If we expose the furcation, then the oral hygiene uh, will be less optimal in the furcation area. There is more risk of caries and calculus buildup in the furcation area and then widening of the furcation lesion, uh, worsening of it, and this will affect the prognosis of the tooth. Uh, so we need to weigh it carefully, the benefits and the risks of exposing the forcation and having maintenance for it. Now, uh, the next factor to evaluate the cemento enable junction position. And here it should be assessed by inserting a periodontal probe subgingivally. Now, if the cemento enable junction is below the gingiva, we need to feel it by the periodontal probe. We will feel like an uh, edge or lid. Uh, we could feel the difference even between the feel of the enamel and the dentine, so and cementum. So this will help us to identify the place of the cemento enamel junction if covered by the gum. Uh, it's more important to manage in cases of altered passive eruption as the bone covering the cemento enamel junction will need to be removed in osseous recontouring in combination with apical flap repositioning. Uh, we will talk about altar passive eruption shortly. Now, in combination with probing depth, the cemento enable junction and the probing depth, the pocket depth, will help us determine clinical attachment level or clinical attachment loss, which is an important diagnostic marker in periodontal examination. And then the classic, when we measure CAL or clinical attachment level or clinical attachment loss, should we subtract or add? In case of recession, we add the distance between the cemento enamel junction and the gingiva, which is recession, to the pocket depth. And in case of gingival overgrowth, we subtract the distance between cemento enamel junction and the gingival level, which is uh, the overgrowth. We subtract that from the depth of the bucket. Okay. Moving on to the biologic width. Biologic width is an important concept. It's defined as the dimension of soft tissue attached to the tooth, coronal to the alveolar bone crest. So this is the periodontal attachment above, or oh, sorry, coronal to the, or below in the lower teeth, in upper teeth, coronal to the uh, alveolar bone level, alveolar bone crest including connective tissue attachment, one millimeter, around one millimeter junctional epithelium, and around half millimeter of sulcus depth. And this, if we sum this, we will get around uh, two millimeter of biologic width. Okay, two to 2.3, 2.4 millimeter of biologic width. Now, this is important. It suggests, uh, they, it, it was suggested now, of course, the importance of it was described from the 60s with Gargilo, Ingbar, and um, it was suggested that there is a physiologic function for this biologic width or supracrystal attachment, and it, uh, it serves to, as a protective barrier, uh, preventing the microbes in the periodontal pocket or around the teeth from reaching the periodontal ligament space and causing periodontal attachment loss. So, subgingival placement of the crown margins, therefore, uh, below the gingival level, might affect the homeostasis or the periodontal tissue, causing inflammation and attachment loss. Uh, however, several views and data exist concerning the ideal dimensions of biologic width, leading to differing recommendations. The mean value for the biologic width around two millimeters to 2.2, 2.3 millimeters. Uh, so it's important to have this amount of at, um, attachment, periodontal attachment, above the level of the uh, alveolar bone crest. And if we violate it, we expect by placing a crown margin or restoration margin within the biologic depth, then we will have more inflammation, more attachment loss, and so we need to account for this. If we have to do uh, that subgingival coronal margin, uh, crown margin, uh, we might need to do crown lengthening to achieve, to reestablish biologic width, as we will see later. 
Now, the ferrule effect. The ferrule effect, what is the ferrule? It's an important concept in calm bridge, uh, which is like a ring of uh, tooth structure, parallel walls uh, around the tooth, encircling the crown, uh, providing a protective effect by reducing stress within the tooth and minimizing fracture of the teeth with posts and cords. Uh, it was advised to have the ferrule, and sometimes we might need to do crown lengthening surgery to establish uh, some exposure of the uh, tooth margin for making a ferrule around it. Uh, the next thing that we need to evaluate, smile line assessment. Assessment of the smile line is important when considering surgery in the aesthetic zone. The baseline of gingiva shown at rest and full smile should be noted and recorded with clinical photography. We need to photograph this and keep it added to the patient record. These photographs will help in engaging the patient, discussing with the patient, explaining them the procedure, and to understand their expectations and what they are looking to achieve from surgery. And uh, of course, we need to measure it both in rest and on uh, movement like in smiling while talking uh, what we call the dynamic and the static uh, smile line among the smile disharmonies excessive gingival tissue display or gummy smile can be associated with several factors the first vertical maxillary growth overgrowth of the maxilla this might need to be corrected by uh, orthodontic treatment or uh, by orthognathic surgery cutting the excess maxillary bone to establish, uh, to re-establish the level of the teeth and the gingiva and there is dental alveolar extrusion as another factor in gummy smile and then there is short upper lip in case of short upper lip we might need to correct it by placing by doing injections of botulinum toxin botox or filler injections to increase, add to the thickness, the depth, the thickness of the gingiva, uh, of the lip, and uh, uh, increasing uh, lip coverage of the gingiva. Also, there is upper lip hyperactivity. Sometimes, in some patients at rest, they have no little show of gingiva, but when they smile or talk, with the um, contraction of the lip muscles, uh, the lip will go up. And expose more gingiva uh, causing gummy smile so again we need to measure the smile line assess the smile line both at rest and at function and uh, alter passive eruption this we will talk about later or a combination of these so it's important to diagnose to the cause of this uh, gummy smile and that will help us in planning the treatment People with gummy smile, there is a problem with gummy smile, sometimes might be stigmatized, these patients, might uh, be subject to ridicule or sarcasm, jokes on them, uh, or they could be judged wrongly, uh, affected with less intellect or trustworthiness or friendliness, or self-confidence might affect uh, self-confidence. So this is a certain, during the history stage, when we talk with a patient, we can a certain how they are affected by for example if they have a gummy smile are they okay with it or they are feeling embarrassed with it they want to correct it this is all done in the evaluation phase it's equally important to assess the gingival margin height and smile line when considering cow lengthening for one tooth or multiple teeth especially if they are in the aesthetic zone um, and during the smile line assessment, we could uh, apply uh, computer technologies uh, in the planning and um, that will help us to uh, produce a predicted result and show it to the patient. And this will help in the discussion with them. Uh, like, for example, in the DSD uh, approach or other software. And now, altered eruption. Since 1933, Gottlieb and Orban described the tooth eruption process and they divided it into two processes, 
active eruption, passive eruption, as we see here, stages of passive eruption and active eruption. Uh, active eruption starts by the tooth coming out of the uh, tooth follicle and the tooth socket and then piercing the gingiva, expo being exposed to the uh, oral cavity. After that, the process of passive eruption starts. So this is all active eruption, it will continue. And then after exposure to the oral cavity, piercing the gingiva, uh, the process of passive eruption starts with and accompanies the active eruption uh, with the gingiva receding uh, to go close to the cemento enamel junction, a little above it. But in some cases, uh, this might increase, continue. Uh, the original article of Gottlieb and Urban, they, uh, th they said that this will continue with the time, causing recession. That's what they thought. Now there are other causes for recession. Uh, now, altered passive eruption or delayed passive eruption was described as a genetic or a developmental condition in which the gingival margin fails to reach the cemento enamel junction and remains coronal to it, resulting in appearance of short clinical counts. So normally, the gingiva should do, after the eruption of the teeth, should continue to recede to get close to the cemento enamel junction. If it didn't, that is, alter passive eruption, the result will be that there is excess gingiva covering the cemento enamel junction that might need to be corrected. It's considered like a genetic or developmental condition leading to aesthetic impairment. It's a normal variation. It's not necessarily pathologic. It's not a disease always. It is like a, an anatomic variation. Now, the most accepted classification of APE, uh, alter passive eruption, was that of Coslet in 1977, as we will explain here. Um, they put two types, one and two, and both of them have classes A and B. Now, the one and two are related to the uh, mucogingival junction, with type one uh, having keratinized gingiva, uh, enough keratinized gingiva. Type two um, has less than enough keratinized gingiva. Now, type one A, the A and B are related to the level of the alveolar bone. Uh, with A, uh, the level of the alveolar bone is uh, li like a normal uh, apical to the cemento enamel junction, so we don't need to do bone surgery. And um, uh, B, the level of the alveolar bone is close to the cemento enamel junction, little uh, overgrowth, let's say, of bone, and so we need to do uh, bone surgery, osseous recontouring, ostectomy, osteoplasty, to reach to the reach it to normal level apical to cement enamel junction. So type 1A adequate keratinized gingiva and the level of cement enamel junction normal apical to cement enamel junction 1.5 millimeter distance. Since the level of the bone is okay, so we don't need uh, bone surgery, but because we have alter passive eruption, the gingiva is covering the cement enamel junction, uh, we need to cut from it. And here, because we have enough keratinized gingiva, so it's okay to cut from that gingiva. We have enough keratinized gingiva to compensate. And then we do gingivectomy. And in type 1B, uh, adequate amount of keratinized gingiva, so we can cut it doing gingivectomy to correct it. But there is additional thing. The level of the alveolar bone is closer to a cement enamel junction, so we need to cut part of the alveolar bone to reach the level of uh, normal attachment established, re-established by logic web. So that's type 1A, 1B. Type 2A, less than optimal. Type 2, as we said, less than optimal uh, thin, uh, let's say, uh, keratinized gingiva. And so it's more precious. We need to keep it. We can't cut it like in type 1. In that case, we need to do a bically repositioned flap. In type 2A, the, with the level of the bone, uh, normal, the apical to a 7 to enamel junction, we don't need to do bone surgery 
no cutting of the bone. But we need to correct the gingiva. We can't, like in type 1, do, do gingivectomy because we have less uh, attached gingiva here. And so we need to do a different procedure, which is apically reposition flap. We place a curricular uh, incision and uh, move the gingiva apically to reach the new level without cutting from the losing any of the keratinized gingiva that we have. So here, yeah, different approach uh, with a bikini reposition flap rather than gingivectomy. And here we maintain the same level of attached gingiva that we have, keratinized gingiva that we have. While in type 1 with gingivectomy, we lose some of the keratinized gingiva, which we have enough of from the start. Uh, type 2B, inadequate amount of attached gingiva, narrow keratinized gingiva, with the level of the alveolar bone close to the cement to enamel junction. So here we need two things. We need to move the gingiva. We can't cut the gingiva again because we have narrow keratinized gingiva, but we need to move the gingiva. We place a cervicular incision and we move the gingiva. And in the same time, we cut the bone doing osseous surgery to correct it. So that's two, type 2B. That's the coslet classification, and with it, the treatment needed for these different cases. Now, we reach into what are the procedures that we need uh, for treatment, um, in, including crown lengthening and the management of gummy smile. First of all, gingivectomy, cutting of excess, removal of excess tissue, with or without gingivoplasty. Gingivoplasty is not cutting, it's reshaping, recontouring of gingival tissue. And uh, sometimes we need gingivectomy, most of the times we need gingivectomy, but not always we need gingivoplasty. So it could be with or without gingivoplasty. And then there is apical repositioning flaps, which we talked about, with or without osteotomy or osteoblasty. So apical gingivectomy in type 1, apical reposition flap in type 2, and um, could be associated with osteotomy, bone removal, or osteoblasty, osseous recontouring. The third modality, orthodontic forced eruption, which is important to consider with or without fibrotomy, we'll show you one case on this. And then there is lip repositioning, surgical procedures to place the upper lip at a low position as part of the management of gummy smile. And we will show you one example of this. And this could include the lip stabilization afterwards with botulinum toxin, botox, or could have also uh, lip fi uh, filler injections. And then, finally, orthodontic therapy, orthodontic treatment, uh, with or without orthognathic surgery, to realign the incisors with improving uh, the part shown of them. Now, let's talk about if we need to do bone surgery or heart tissue surgery. Osseous recontour could be undertaken using different techniques. Hand instrumentation first, using periodontal hand instruments, such as chisels, bone files, it is technique sensitive and can be time consuming. Or by the use of bears and hand pieces, round bear could be used in the low speed hand piece with adequate irrigation. To minimize damage to the tooth surfaces, root surfaces, especially in the interdental area, we could use an end cutting bear. Um, and piece of surgery is a method of bone removal based on ultrasonics. It's uh, developed by Versaluti in 2004. It's basically like a kind of scalar, super special scalar with special tips and uh, different machine. Um, piezo surgical uh, by voltage applied through polarized uh, piezo ceramic material causing micro movements in it, leading to a vibration in the hand piece, uh, which is capable of osteoplasty and osteotomy. Uh, various tips are available, can be used to access difficult areas such as interproximally with the added benefit of working on bone only without tooth cutting. So it's less traumatic to the tooth structure. And finally, laser 
some laser units should be used for heart tissue surgery like short pulsed uh, erbium YAG and ND YAG, erbium chromium, ytterium and uh, carbon dioxide and some units are used only for soft tissue surgery and then conventional or scalpel surgery uh, conventional or scalpel surgery this example here needing cow lengthening done by scalpel surgery conventional surgery we can see the amount of the roots exposed the post-operative radiograph here this range of scalpel plates and the scalpel holders and blade holders and um, the bears that we use and this is the end cutting bear that we talked about looks like a cylinder a smooth cylinder with no cutting edge at the sides only at the tip so this could be used to reduce the level of the alveolar bone in the interdental areas without uh, damaging the root surfaces and then we see a variety of ceramic uh, bears. These bears could be useful in the processes needing uh, gingiv gingivoplasty, recontouring or reshaping of the gingiva. So these are ceramic bears. Now, electrosurgery is another modality for doing the procedure, uh, used for soft tissue surgery, and we'll say why. Uh, this is a case, for example, from the literature from Bashiti, uh, with subgingival caries on 3, 4, uh, 4, 3, and 4, 4. And here, cleaning of caries and electrosurgery to do gingivectomy and expose the margin of sound to structure. And then crowns placed here. These are electrosurgery tips. There is a thing about electrosurgery important to remember, or two things actually. Uh, first, the smell the smell of burning uh, soft tissue uh, could be annoying to the patient. The second is we need to be very careful not to touch alveolar bone with the electro electrocautery tip because if we do so, we might result in bone necrosis. And so this is strictly soft tissue only. No, it's not used for heart tissue surgery, not for bone surgery soft tissue only and then piezo surgery we talked about piezo surgery we can see here an example uh, from the literature and we can see here cutting of the uh, buccal and lingual bones we can see different tips uh, this looks like a round rounded like uh, closer to the round bear and this one uh, is more tapered and could be used in the interdental area uh, let's repeat again that it's less traumatic to a tooth structure. Uh, we could cut the bone with less damage to a tooth structure. Uh, laser assisted surgery. Now, um, there are some soft tissue and hard tissue lasers. Uh, this example here from the literature by Lee, uh, they used Herbum YAG and DIAG, which are uh, used for both hard tissue and soft tissue surgery. In this case, it was soft tissue only. So, um, they are uh, used here. Caution should be exercised to avoid abrasion of tooth surface because we talk about hard tissue laser. But if we use soft tissue laser, less risk of damage to the tooth structure. Uh, this is an example of hard tissue laser hard tissue, soft tissue laser, this is an erbium YAG laser and this is another example for soft tissue laser which is a diode laser in this case um, a different variety of machines and uh, laser machines that are available uh, different costs, more expensive with hard tissue lasers but very useful if used properly now, the use of surgical guides uh, surgical guides are important during treatment, used in treatment planning. Um, they could be constructed in the lab uh, on casts or they could be done by CAD CAM if we have that facility. Uh, they are useful in the treatment planning stage. They could be done like soft tissue uh, only or they could be done uh, to the level of the bone 
or we could use a single uh, surgical guide with marking for the level of the alveolar bone evaluated at the start of procedure and marking for the level of the gingiva that we expect to cut. Um, this will help make our procedure easier. Now for the clinical cases. Uh, some of these cases are done by me and some other cases I took from the literature to explain the concepts that we're talking about. The first case, this is done by me. Uh, this is a single tooth, heart tissue and soft tissue surgery. 14 years old female patient with tooth needing root canal treatment, uh, broken down in the buccal surface with sub the defect reaching subgingivelli. Here, we did elevate the flap, we did recontour the bone, and here we can see the forcation visible in this tooth. And uh, we could notice there was a defect, a carious defect, uh, below the level of the initial restoration. And uh, here, with the uh, periodontal back in place after surgery, and here after removing the periodontal back, uh, we had to place a uh, glass enamel filling in the defect subgingivelli after cleaning it. And we can see here like two fillings of glass enamel on the same tooth. We refer that uh, patient back to the endodontist to finish the root canal and do a root canal filling. And then uh, they will be referred to the prostodontist to place a crown on this tooth. Okay, the second case uh, done by me a long time ago. And um, this is a soft tissue crown lengthening procedure uh, with cutting one to two milli one millimeter, around one to two millimeter. That's what is needed. Minimal amount of uh, show of gingiva, uh, gummy smile with minimal show of gingiva. So it was planned as soft tissue. We measured the pocket depths and we found we have enough keratinized tissue. We have enough uh, level of uh, gingiva. So the plan was soft tissue surgery, cutting one to two millimeters of the gingiva in different places. And that was it. The third case is from literature from Calci. Uh, this is a 14 years old patient presenting with uh, altered passive eruption. We can see it's thick biotype and um, we can see the thickness of the gingiva. This case was done in two stages. The first stage of treatment involves gingivectomy to debulk the tissues. We can see here the cutting of gingiva. Uh, we can see the encased length of the clinical crowns. And then, but the gingiva is still thick. This is followed by a second procedure with more gingivectomy and bone surgery, osteoplasty. And here um, we see the flap raised and we see uh, the osteotomy uh, before the osteoplasty. And here, after the osteoplasty, uh, establishing the biological contour of the bone. And this is after healing the final post-operative photo. We can see the normal appearance of teeth, more exposure of clinical crowns, and the thickness of the gingiva is less, as we can see here. The next case is done by me. And this is a 31-year-old female patient with a broken down to 5. We can see the level of, this is for root canal treatment, referred for by the Induron test. And in this case, we uh, did soft tissue and hard tissue surgery. We can see the preclinical, the, sur the surgery time. And we can see the level of the destruction of the tooth structure. Um, here, this is after the restoration doing a composite restoration afterwards we did uh, use a periodontal back first to hold the level of the gingiva and this is after removal of the periodontal back and this is from the procedure itself the preoperative photos and then this is the buccal bone surgery we can see the level of buccal bone before osseous surgery and after cutting of the bone with recontouring, reshaping of the bone. And this is the level after surgery. Um, sorry, the lingual bone, come on. Yeah, the lingual bone here, we can see before surgery and after surgery. 
and here we can see the level of the tooth structure and the bone around it and here the level of the tooth structure above the bone and uh, that was soft tissue heart tissue surgery uh, the patient was referred back to the endodontist to finish the root canal and then they will be referred to the prosthodontist to place a crown on this tooth so that's it the next case was done by me also and this is a gingival overgrowth uh, this is a patient 42 years old with aggressive periodontitis. There are deep pockets here with inflammation of the gingiva. There is a thing here. Can you see the redness of the gingiva? Uh, there is a complicating factor here, the traumatic bite. You can see here the level of the incisal edge biting on the gum here. The incisal edge from the lower uh, teeth, lower incisors, biting on the gum, causing pain for the patient. So part of the treatment was to cut the gingiva here to establish the normal level away from the bite and of course with scaling, root planing for the management of periodontitis. So that's about this case. Uh, gingival overgrowth palatally with traumatic overbite as we can see here. The next case uh, here we can see a lesion of the gingiva. It's a 33-year-old lady with history of gestational diabetes mellitus and uh, also anemia. And uh, she has uh, that lesion. We cut that lesion, uh, did a bit of gingivectomy. So this is also a crown lengthening surgery with gingivectomy a removal of the lesion. It was sent for histology and the diagnosis was giant cell granuloma um, or what we call also, uh, pregnancy epilis. The next case is from the literature, uh, Rajendran 215. And here we can see a tooth that's badly decayed, distracted. It's an incisor, so it was important to keep it in that patient. The treatment chosen in this case, uh, what was it? Is it crown lengthening? We have enough keratinized gingiva, we have everything. But there is a problem here, uh, that's why we included this case. There is a problem here, if we do here, for example, gingivectomy, then we need to cut from the gingiva of the other teeth to match the appearance, because this is in the aesthetic zone, and this is more loss of the attachment. In that case, it was decided to use orthodontic extrusion, and rapid, the modality here is rapid orthodontic extrusion of 1-1, one, one, uh, with supracrystal fibrotomy. We will see here, uh, they attached the uh, fixed orthodontic appliance on the upper teeth and they joined the tooth to it with a post first that they attached it to it with a wire, pulled the tooth out, connecting it to the appliance and then when it is a little out, they attached uh, an orthodontic attachment to it, a specific one, and they continued pulling it out. The appliance was activated every seven days each week they uh, activated the appliance and at the same time they did supracrystal fibrotomy circumferential around the tooth they cut the attached ging the gingival attachment around the tooth this is to facilitate the movement of the tooth and uh, make it quicker and so they achieved one millimeter each week within a month four millimeters we can see here four millimeters exposed from the tooth compared to the original condition. Of course, this needed uh, good planning. Uh, there should be an enough crown, uh, root structure so that they can pull this amount without compromising the attachment, the periodontal attachment. Um, after finishing the extrusion of the tooth, they placed, uh, they stabilized it for uh, four months, the splinting, and they put a crown on it. So that's an important modality, uh, useful in some cases. That needs a bit of orthodontics, uh, coordination with the orthodontist. Now our final case, an important one. Uh, that's a gummy smile uh, treated by lip repositioning and Botox. And we can see here, this is from the literature Lubna Ali and Nili Hamudan to 16. Uh, this is preoperative. Um, we can see the gummy smile case that we have. 
This is the lip repositioning surgery. We can see the cuts, uh, no anesthesia uh, in this area. Anesthesia uh, was done by block so that uh, the buffing effect of anesthesia won't uh, affect the result of this surgery. We can, uh, they could see um, clearly the incisions that they needed. So the two incisions joining them and then uh, moving the gingiva. Uh, the flap here, moving the gingiva, and then uh, suturing at a higher level. We can see the result here after lip repositioning. See the difference, how much improvement in the gummy smile. And uh, the thing is, we can see there is still more, uh, some gingival show. The patient wasn't satisfied with this. She, they wanted uh, full coverage of the gingiva. So uh, the modality chosen was Botox. They injected Botox in the upper lip and this caused it to move a little downwards and stabilize at a lower level to get the needed result with full coverage of the gingiva and no gummy smile at all. We can see the dramatic difference here. This is an important modality that could be used. Uh, includes uh, work of cosmetic uh, surgeons um, maybe maxillofacial surgeons. Uh, my good friend Dr. Islam Qasim is an expert in this. Finally, complications. Uh, patients should be informed about the possibility of the following post-operative complications while taking their consent. Um, they need to be told what to expect. The first complication, increased spacing between the teeth. Uh, the patients might complain of like black triangles black spaces between the teeth because now the gum is more receded now and there is more spacing between the teeth. This might need correction in the restoration afterwards by placing new crowns or new veneers or new composite fillings with new contour for the teeth that closes these spaces. And then there is tooth mobility. Uh, the patient should be warned after periodontal surgery there could be a in transient increase in tooth mobility after surgery, which will improve later gradually with post-operative healing. Next complication is tooth sensitivity, which could be transient or long-term. The patient should be warned that there might be increased tooth sensitivity after surgery, and uh, there are treatment modalities that could be offered to them we could, for example, apply fluoride for them. We could advise them to use desensitizing toothpastes. Uh, we could place restorations in teeth that need it. We could uh, use lasers, desensitization. So multiple uh, modalities for treatment of sensitivity. And root resorption, and a small risk of root resorption, minimal, could be more in case of orthodontic movement. The patient will be warned about it before surgery during the consent phase. And that's it. So thank you very much for uh, attending this lecture. I hope that we added to you in it. I hope it was an interesting lecture. Thank you very much to you all. And happy Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.